Hi, right, right, this is your boy Life of Darius, aka Dre the Martian, and we are back. We're back today with a, a bonus video, an interlude video, whatever you want to call it. I'm trying to just push more content out to the streets, man. I'm trying to be a little more consistent, right? Everything doesn't have to be just this grand 40, 50 minute long album reaction, right? We can just chill sometimes. And we're starting off today with The Beatles Stumble. The history of Beatles for sale, y'all. I, I don't co-sign this title, y'all. That's that's kind of crazy, right? Now, it's no secret, man. In my um, listening of the early era Beatles albums, my least favorite album was Beatles for Sale, right? Like, it it, it, it rubbed me the wrong way the first time I listened to it, y'all. And I don't know why. I'm telling y'all, I just think, like, sonically, it was such a shift, right? And it wasn't like a shift, like an advanced shift. Like, they definitely advanced their writing. But sonically, I think it went backwards, right? So it, you got this kind of like tug and pull with this album where they're making better songs. But then there's just so much muck to get through, in my opinion. And that's just kind of what put the album down with me, at least in first reaction form, right? I will say I have come to appreciate the album a little bit more. I really do like the first five tracks, right? I think everything until Mr. Moonlight is really solid. Then we pick it back up with uh, what Kansas City, Hey, Hey, Hey. And then um, what's the song called? Eight Days a Week. And those are two really great songs to me, right? It's just after those eight tracks I just still can't really get with. Outside of um, I Don't Want to Spoil the Party and What You're Doing, like everything after track eight, even after subsequent listens, I just can't get with anything else after that. But I will say I come around to rock and roll music, and even Mr. Moonlight a little bit. Like It's not a terrible song. It's just kind of annoying, right? Right, so definitely the most controversial of all my Beatles listening, so that's kind of why I wanted to get some more context on that album, right? Right, I see the comments of y'all explaining like the burnout, the back to back to back to back albums and touring and things of that nature. And I can process it through that, but I also just want to, you know, get some information in, in video form. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for those probably wondering, yes, this is the first video I've actually recorded since my um, Rubber Soul reaction dropped. And I got a lot to say to some of y'all, man. Some of y'all. Some of y'all been in the comments tweaking, man, but this this ain't the video for that, man. This ain't the place for that, man. We'll, I'll get to y'all at a, another point in time. Trust me. For anybody wondering when Revolver is going to drop, what it's probably going to look like is the Help movie is going to drop on Friday, and then Revolver is going to drop next Wednesday. I told y'all I drop Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays now, and I know y'all probably asking, okay, what's going to drop on Tuesday? And <laughs> Listen, y'all, there's been a big elephant in the room on my channel, y'all. A certain name that's been popping up on pretty much every single Beatles video, right? A name that... You know, I'm kind of surprised that it's been popping up on all my Beatles videos, but I understand, right? Because it seems like this person has a lot of influence on a lot of um, these songs I'm listening to, especially this album, uh, Beatles for Sale. They have a lot of influence on this album, so if y'all can kind of guess who that is, y'all know it's dropping on Tuesday, right? But anyway, <laughs> enough talking. We're here today, man, to learn why Beatles for Sale was a stumble. That's tough, man. Let's get to it, y'all. Yeah. The Beatles had owned 1964. For they sure. conquered the U.S., Most made their definitely. film debut with a major motion picture, broken tour attendance records, and after two albums combining their own material with a few covers, they had their first album of all their own songs, all in the same year. The Beatles had Classic. maintained a momentum never before Classic seen in run. an artist's career, and without forgetting all of the work of their earlier years. Go to run. But their busy schedule was giving rise to signs of burnout. Albums, singles, EPs and tours were piling up on top of each other with hardly a break. The Beatles themselves were changing the way the business worked, and the record industry continued to doubt their stars. Dang, they would try on. to squeeze every last penny before, according to their predictions, the bubble that kept the quartet's fame alive would burst. The result of all of this was Beatles for Sale, an album that even in its title reflected a tired group, yeah. looking straight into the lens, almost emotionless. John, Paul, George, <laughs> and Ringo crazy. recorded the angriest and most aggressive album in the Beatles catalog. One, two, three, four. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> Jack. The Christmas market was just around the corner when EMI pressured George Martin and the Beatles to record a new album to make the most of the season. Christmas Although they market. had spent most of the year touring the world, on October 9th, John Lennon's 24th birthday, the Beatles resumed their concert activities for a closing tour of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Although they had dates until November 10th, they also added a Christmas concert. The Beatles were tasked with recording a new album between the small gaps in their schedule during this period. 
Once again, mm. Lennon and McCartney were forced to work under pressure. Between hotel rooms, flights, and travel, they were tasked with composing new music. Grind. Between November 1963 Grind. and December 1964, the Beatles had practically recorded three albums, not counting their singles. <laughs> At this point, John and Paul did not have enough material to complete a new album, and as a throwback, they had to go back to the covers again to complete the album track list. Mm. This album also marked the first division in the songwriting partnership between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. The lead wow. writer of any Lennon-McCartney song would generally be their lead singer from that point on. Mm. In addition, the band was beginning to Maybe absorb for the best. new influences. In this case, they were delving into folk music thanks to their new friendship with Bob Dylan. Hey. They had just met him. Dylan's Bob reflection Dylan. in Lennon's work was almost immediate, and on this album, it is noticeable. His songs were acquiring a darker and more melancholic tone. Added to that, Dylan had introduced them to marijuana. Oh, yeah. Without the enthusiasm of the Bob previous Dylan. albums, the Beatles began the sessions of their new single on October 18, 1964. Dylan. I Feel Fine, She's a Woman, was released on November 23rd and was not part of the album track list. Mm. Respecting their faithful policy of not including their singles in the track list of their yeah, albums. Y'all told me that on Past Masters video, those two were for Beatles for Sale. I think that's the feedback I was talking about. That on sound, Fine. which that's turned crazy. out to be accidental when the guitar was brought close to the amplifier, yeah, that's would be crazy. one of the band's first approaches to experimentation. And to this sound was added Lennon's guitar riff, which was heavily influenced by Bobby Parker's song, Watch Your Step. Oh, hell yeah. Also, here was born the guitar feedback in the record. Come on. Why do they always do Ringo like this, bro? These dudes is playing instruments, and Ringo is riding a a, a scooty bike. What is this? Is this a, a Peloton? What is going on, bro? This is this is crazy how they do Ringo, <laughs> right? But I gotta be doing Ringo the same way on my channel. It, it, it's unfortunate, right? But it, it, we love him. Peace, love, all that, man. We love Ringo. <laughs> so, here was born the guitar feedback and the recordings that would later mark the sound of the '60s. Mm. That's me completely, including the guitar lick with the first feedback anywhere. I defy anybody to find a record, unless it is some old blues records from 1922 that uses feedback that way. So I claim it for the Beatles. Before Hendrix, before The Who, before anybody. The first feedback on record. Okay. Although the use of feedback was common Talk for people shit, like Jeff Beck in concerts. Even Ray Davis himself said that Lennon copied it after the Beatles and the Kinks shared a bill in mid-1964. Oh, hold on, It was what? the Beatles who were the first to introduce it on a recording. The single went to number one and stayed there for a few weeks. And although the single was full of enthusiasm, pessimism would be a crucial part of the new recordings. Pop could also sing about other subjects, and the Beatles were discovering that. Mm. Lennon would later declare that he was perhaps unconsciously showing his disillusionment. The group was becoming a victim of the negative side of fame, and although it would become in the public eye the most irregular and unwelcoming of their early albums, it is a fact that any <laughs> band of the time would have given their lives That's to how an I would describe album sale, unwelcoming. Standard. I'm a therapist who goes That's there. the perfect way to describe that so album, y'all. I'm going to be honest. Unwelcoming. The thing is, though, therapists are human I didn't, beings. I didn't feel welcome like to the Beatles you. show. If you've been thinking about or... This happened once before, but I can't your door. While A Hard no Day's reply. Night was a soundtrack designed to showcase the personalities and paths really of each bad. member, here we get a sense of where each was creatively. At the helm, as usual in those years, is John, who kicks off the album with no reply, Banger. which presumes to shy away from the classic love themes Banger. about, say, a boy falls in love with a girl and takes a turn towards much more bitter subject matter. Lennon shows much more insecurity, given that his friend doesn't answer any of his calls and won't accept him. The efforts of the That's song's protagonist are futile. Lennon denied that the lyrics had any relation to his personal experiences, saying, An English boy never calls on the phone. This song was to be given to Tommy Cook <laughs> hey, in the might summer, be right. <laughs> but he didn't quite like it and turned it down. Is that facts? In English? either songs, the Somebody Beatles returned to the song people. after a demo recording they had made months earlier, which is the one heard on Anthology. With more willingness and completely changing the almost parody atmosphere they had given it, Lennon even imitates a little of his singing in the demo. The Beatles managed to record a decent opening for their new album. Of all the love I have won, or have lost. The beginning of Beatles for Sale is usually considered as the darkest Never beginning of the band's discography crossed. due to the negative streak of the first songs, yeah. which contrasted greatly with the group's cheerful image. I'm a Loser opens a tendency that Lennon would carry in some of his lyrics in the following years. Mm -hmm. His lack of happiness, his personal dissatisfaction that later, in a much more notorious way, he would reflect and help. 
Beyond the theme of the lack of love the song addresses, Lennon reflects in a subtext of bitter feeling. He feels that he's betrayed himself in exchange for being part of the most famous band in the world, mm. although this often enclosed him in a media circus. Tuh. Lennon describes himself as at the lowest point he had been to up to that point, complaining about a love that had turned bitter. Nah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Babies in black, babies in black. I'm going to be honest with y'all. On first listen, man, that little twang that they were singing with, it didn't really... It gave me, like, Chains flashbacks, man. But this song is nothing like Chains. This is actually a really good song. Apparently, this is like a certain style of music, like some type of waltzy music or something like that y'all were telling me. I don't know if I ever dig into that <laughs> genre of music, but it sounds interesting. Right? It sounds interesting, and it's a, it's, it's a pretty good song. It's actually, the first three songs are actually really pretty good. Like, there are a lot of good songs on Beatles for Sale. It's just too much bullshit thrown in there, man. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I like it. Yeah. Starting on August 11th, and probably composed in a hotel room, this 50-50 song between John and Paul was probably written in a hurry. Fourteen takes were necessary to complete it, and it wow. seemed that no one cared much about the details of the song. The country, which would completely dominate the album, throws up this song, which in lyrics is depressing. And for some experts, speaking of a band that was magnificent at performing, thanks to all their years of experience, this is one of the most fragile performances in the band's career. That's a good point. Nah, that's a banger, y'all. I ain't gonna the depressing lie. tone of the album changes completely. Yeah, Rock and roll music, just originally by Chuck Facts. Berry, became one of the best covers made by the Beatles. It's For hard, many, but it's, it's the best moment of the lash. album. The piano, oh, played by George Martin, completely changes the song, and the performance returns the Beatles to their natural state. It became the basis of their concerts from then until 1966. Yeah, I'll Follow the Sun is the first song by Paul McCartney for the album. But it was not I'm sorry, y'all. It's so crazy. Like, we went through the first... This is, like, the fifth track now, right? And I said I like all these songs. The concept of Beatles for a maybe that's the issue. Because I feel like the it could have been... If they went all the way to the darkness on that album, which was just never going to happen in 1964, right? That was just never going to happen. But if they could have... Oh, my God, bro. Like, like this... Like, bro. This could have been on, like, Rubber Soul level. I, just, I feel like that. Because there's so many great... Damn near classic songs on here already. It's just held down by filler. Like, this is the only Beatles album I've heard where I can say there's legitimately filler, right? Maybe the White Album, but that's 30 freaking tracks, right? There should be a little bit filler on, a little bit of filler on there. But this one here, Beatles for Sale, that's just, yeah, man. I'll Follow the Sun is the first song by Paul McCartney for the album. But it was not exactly a new song, as it was one of the first songs written by Paul McCartney. Even a home recording survives of the Beatles performing it dating back to 1960, recorded wow. in Paul's house. I gotta, I, I gotta hear um, these little tracks like Paul this, had like tried the, to place it on the Beatles' the first outcuts, album, but it was takes, not to the band's total liking. And it was not point. until this album that he managed to find a space for it. This Roy Lee Johnson song right was always one of Lennon's favorites. It's the recording again wow. did not have the great effort of the Beatles at the time of recording it. I don't it was perceived it. 100% as a filler track. Yeah, I just don't love it like I should, man. Side A closes with these two songs in which McCartney can showcase his rocking vocal range. The song was a regular for the Beatles in their Hamburg period and at the Cavern. So well did they know the tune that it practically stayed in one take. Take mm. one is the one that is part of the album. That's and the hard. second one, as a pure protection, is the one heard on Anthology. In the end, the song ended up being another reflection of the band's interpretive capacity. Yeah. Oh, I really, hey, this song? This song gave many problems yeah. to the Beatles during its composition and oh. recording. When they arrived at the studio, hey, week, they were classic. not clear about many things about the song, and the beginning was a big problem. They experimented with several things until it occurred to them to remove the chorus and start with the fade out. It had never happened before. Although many songs ended like that, it was not common to start in that way. Oh, they in a not so common the case song. in the recording dynamics, Lennon ended up doing first the feedback, vocals, the first fade in. It was actually a McCartney song. Even the song like was weakest album commercial, And in the United States, it was released as a single. It was number one. If no. there are tributes to some of their greatest no. idols in this album, no. as is the case of Chuck Berry or Little Richard, another reference of the band is honored here. Yeah, Buddy Holly. If y'all don't got arcade, y'all better get arcade. It has the best samples in the game. It was recorded on October 18th in a very heavy session in which a great part of the album was recorded. This was the last one of that long day. August 18th, shout out August 18th. Were recorded. The song birthday. lacks anything, 
it is perhaps due to the tiredness and little enthusiasm they could put into it. Mm. Ringo had not sung on a hard day's <laughs> night. I'm sorry. Hello. I'm not laughing at Ringo, y'all. I'm just la- I'm laughing at the song, so I guess I am laughing at Ringo. But I just remembered, like, I didn't talk about this song <laughs> during the reaction, right? It, it just felt like, because there wasn't really nothing to say about this song. Like, I feel like I could have made this song. I'm not trying to disrespect the Rigo or the Beatles, but I feel like I could have made Honey Don't. Like, that's kind of the vibe I got from this song. And <laughs> my opinion hasn't changed very much on this one, y'all. This is, just, we're, on a, we're on a bad streak right now. Where's the love, Honey Don't? Like, it just, yeah. So this is his return to the Beatles track list singing. Now in tribute his to return. Carl Perkins and recorded in the last session of the album on October 26th. The last session. Ringo sings a number that was already routine for the group, although it was almost always performed by John. Every little thing pretty solid. Aware that he had to write better songs to beat this John to the A-sides of the singles, mm-hmm. every little thing was written by Paul with a certainty that it would be a commercial success for the group. But little by little, this idea went away from McCartney mm-hmm. when he discovered that the song didn't have the potential he considered it to have. It wasn't until this album wow. when he dusted himself off and finally found a space. Just like in Eight Days a Week, McCartney gave the lead vocal to Lennon, and with four takes, it was enough. Wow. Great, great song right here. In this country and western, the topics that Lennon showed as author in the first songs of the album return, the dissatisfaction, the insecurity in him, Mm -hmm. and not to spoil the party. Why are you looking at me like that, John? Stop looking at me like that. They changed the roles for the song that we already mentioned. This is one of the best songs of the album. I'm uncomfortable. One of the best achieved. I'm really uncomfortable, Music Box. Thank you. What you doing? The closing of the album is approached with a song by Paul that usually enjoys a good reputation. This the very different outro. personalities and ways of seeing the world of John and Paul get a great reflection in this album, mm-hmm. where the contrast between the songs of both is enormous. Ringo's drumming is heavily influenced by the Ronettes' Be My Baby, and of course, Phil Spector's production. Ugh. Yeah. The lyrics refer to his unstable okay, relationship with Jane Asher, and it wouldn't be the first time Paul would write a song of this kind. It is one of the best songs on the album. Well, it took some honey. Thrust it up and they called it. Nah. The album closes with another nah, cover of Carl Perkins, like this, now led bro. by George Harrison, who yeah, in one way or George another like pays tribute to him throughout the album and his guitar contributions. <clears throat> it was also recorded in one take, and although it is not a bad closing, perhaps with a little more time and less fatigue, yeah. it could have been recorded better. Facts. Still, it is a very worthy closing for the conditions in which the album was recorded. Worthy? Interesting. Beatles for Sale was I released on December 4th of 1964. I have to. That sounds It stayed crazy. at the top of the charts for nine weeks in a row and knocked A Hard Day's Night, their previous album, out of the top spot. Okay. The it album had 700,000 pre-orders, and without so much questioning, the public embraced the album with total normality. Right, it seemed okay. that everything the Beatles played turned into gold, and the record label knew that better than anyone. That's crazy. That's crazy how they just like, yo, it's the Beatles. The band's fans we, we received the album with enthusiasm, <laughs> I don't care without noticing the physical sound. and That's mental hard. wear and tear on the group. The album received favorable reviews in the UK music press. Chris Welch of Melody Maker found the music honest and inventive and predictive. Beatles for Sale will sell, sell, sell. It easily lives up to the hype and will blow away pop, rock, R&B, and Beatles fans. Mm. And while the title had a hint of cynicism, it described the Beatles as a product to sell. The fact is that it did sell. That's what it was. It did deliver. It would set a precedent for the Beatles to demand better conditions and times to record their new material in the future. The, the mindset of the Beatles is so interesting. I'm sorry for pause and stuff, but like, like you know, I just recently rewatched the number one songs of the '60s video, bro, and it was so blatant. Like when um, I want to hold your hand came on, it was like a whole nother universe. It's like we, it's like we went from 1962 got down to 1993. Like it was like we transformed 30 years in just one year because of the Beatles, bro. And having that level of influence, clout, fame. But combine all that with just being really talented artists and really feeling like they, like they knew they were confident in themselves in their talent. They knew what they were, and to like like so quickly realize like they realize this quickly like yo y'all are y'all are doing too much. Y'all are overworking us. All these albums, these singles, these shows. This is too like bro. We just we want to make it's time to make good music. 
right? And that's what, that's the coolest thing about the Beatles. Like, we love when an artist's discovery just starts off perfect from, from the debut album. Like, oh, you got, they got their sound, they got, like, their, the hits and all that, like, perfected from the first album. That's cool. Like, we love artists like that. But I just feel like it's always easier to get attached to artists when you see the, you see the progression and how big it was. Like, they broke out the chains. Like, they, they, they started off free. Right, and slowly and slowly throughout the first couple of years, they were getting chained up, and then they was like, nah, fuck that. Fuck that, bro. Like, that. <laughs> baby, you can drive our car. Like, fuck, we turn it up, man. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, if y'all get what I'm saying, yeah. Oh, the pessimistic mood of Beatles for Sale this was reflected in the nuts. album cover, which shows the Beatles serious and tired. Looking into the camera, well, Robert be looking Green, at me like that, who at the bro, time stop. was the band's head photographer. John the concept tweaking. was briefly discussed with Brian Epstein and the Beatles beforehand, mm. namely that he would produce a color image of the group photographed at an outdoor location towards dusk, which ended up being London's Hyde Park. Mm. The cover did not carry the band's logo or artist credit, and the album title was depicted in tiny type compared to standard LPR work of the time. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even notice that. I didn't even notice that part. Used to moving the track list to their liking and Real completely subtle. changed the official discography of the band, the Beatles 65 album was released in the United States. That would be the equivalent of the British Beatles for sale. The album became a huge hit in the United States, jumping straight from number 98 I do want to, hear these to number versions. one, making it the, the biggest American jump versions. to the top position in history of the Billboard charts up to that time. There are several versions that claim the origin of the title Eight Days a Week, the first and most famous as a phrase of Ringo, similar to the case of Hard Day's Night. The second, Dates back to the limousine driver who told it to hey, Ringo could have been a rapper. The third yeah. was conceived by John and Paul. You know he be turning phrases. Brian Ringo Epstein could have been a in his working days. I believe And the fourth related to the title Eight Arms to Hold. Like dates back to the limousine driver who told it to McCartney. The third was conceived by John and Paul in reference to Brian Epstein <laughs> and his working days. And the fourth related to the title Eight Arms to Hold You, which was the original title of the film that later became Help. Eight Over arms the to years, hold you. these versions have been questioned, and there is no 100% certainty as to which is the real version. Before his Christmas engagements, Ringo Starr underwent surgery due to a nostril pain, and Jimmy Nickel was thought to cover for him again. That's not funny. But two weeks earlier, the drummer was released and managed to recover for the performances. According to music journalist Neil Spencer, the album's title was an apt comment on the band's unprecedented commercial value as no, artists, sorry, crazy. given the plethora of Beatles-related products introduced during the previous year. Ringo Jackson. The Beatles for Sale cover notes yeah, were written by Derek Taylor, who until a recent falling out with Epstein, had been the band's press officer, when, in a generation or so, a radioactive cigar-smoking child, picnicking on Saturn, asked you what the Beatles affair was all about, did you actually know them? Don't try to explain all about their long hair and the screams. Just play the child a few tracks from this album, and he'll probably understand what it was all about. Mm. The kids of AD 2000 will draw from the music much more of the same sense of well-being and warmth as we do today. Yep. The Beatles for Sale was recorded on a four-track tape. The first CD version was only available in mono. Beatles for Sale ranked 71st among the best albums in the 1987 edition of the book Critics' Choice by Paul Gambaccini. Based on a panel presentation of 81 Gambaccini. critics and broadcasters, in 2000, it was voted 204th in the third edition of the book, All-Time Top 1000 Albums by Colin Larkin. Okay. Beatles for Sale was released as an EP on April 6th, 1965. It is the band's eighth official EP and contains yeah, four tracks from the main LP of the same name. The EP is only available in mono. Jesus. It was also released in Australia and India. <laughs> Beatles for Sale is a transitional album. Experimentation in the studio was becoming more important for the band. It gave a glimpse of what the Beatles would become. Mm -hmm. But despite the marijuana that was creeping into their lives <laughs> and the absolute pressure to meet their schedules, Bobby Dylan. it makes the album at times feel heavy. Yeah. As if the Beatles' creativity was in a kind of anger or fed up. It contrasts completely with the atmosphere that they created for A Hard Day's Night mm. and does not enjoy the much more relaxed state that Help was. The Beatles themselves labeled it as a disaster, but it's a really good disaster. The yeah. Beatles' lyrics start to become much more personal. Beatles for Sale showed us that things could I don't could think the Beatles could have made a disaster if they wanted on to. The following recordings. I just don't think it's so. It's still a very good album in its own right. The vocals are, as expected, incredible. With some really impressive harmonies, and George's folk-inspired guitar playing is really nice. Of course. In other words, as is typical of the band, the musicality is brilliant, and each member does their own thing to grab your attention. And no, Beatles for Sale is not the best example of the Beatles' immersive songwriting prowess. Mm -hmm. But from many points of view, it's still brilliant. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all for now. If you liked it, we invite you to subscribe 
and like our video. Comment for sure, Music Box. Think. Subscribe to, to Music Box USA. This 2024. Subscribe to Darius Thanks Devon. for watching. This is Music Box. You can do that. All right, y'all. So that was um, Music Box USA, The Beatles Stumble, History of Beatles for Sale. And that, that was a really good video, y'all. I'm glad that I'm, I'm making good choices picking these videos, man, because a lot of these little Beatles doc videos end up being a little garbage, right? But this one was amazing, man. Y'all should definitely go check out Music Box USA. They actually they have another video that I'm going to check out pretty soon on the channel, the, yeah, the story of Rubber Soul, y'all. I, I really want to talk about how I feel about Rubber Soul right now, but I want to wait till the Revolver reaction. But I do just want to say, bro, like, yeah, bruh, I've been obsessed with Rubber Soul. But yeah, I think he did a really good job breaking down the history of this album and really like seeing the track list broken down in front of me like this. There are only really like three or four tracks that I really just didn't like on the album. But when it comes to Beatles albums, there are not normally more than maybe one track that I don't really like, right? So having four or five of those on this album, that's just what makes it stick out like a sore thumb to me. Just the whiplash and the track listing and all that just... I understand how this album could be loved by a lot. The country vibes, the folk vibes, like the real, like, you know, laid back, um, introspective lyrics. Like, I understand most definitely. And I think um, listening to Rubber Soul has actually made me appreciate Beatles for Sale a little bit more, but it's still my least favorite out the early Beatles albums, y'all. It just is, man. And maybe I'll come around to it one day, man, but it, today is not that day, y'all. But anyway, <laughs> like I said earlier in the video, we got um, the Help movie reaction dropping Friday. We got Revolver dropping next Wednesday and then next Tuesday. I got a surprise for y'all, man. Y'all just stay tuned, y'all. That's that's it, man. But great video. I'm hoping I'm going to do a lot more of these throughout the weeks, man. Like, if I don't have a video ready on Tuesday or Wednesday, just do something like this, right? It's the perfect way to do it, y'all. So, anyway, with that being said, I'm going to bid y'all a dude. It's your boy, Life of Darius, a.k.a. Mr. Moonlight. And I am hot. Jesus Sanders, man.